agreed to settlement terms with nearly 500 plaintiffs in cases brought by groups who were targeted by the Internal Revenue Service when they applied for tax-exempt status based on inappropriate criteria. Criteria like this. If you use in your name Tea Party, Patriots, 912, or policy questions concerning government spending or taxes, education of the public to, quote, make America a better place to live, close quote. That was suspicious. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, our statements criticizing how the country was being run. They don't like that either. Uh, so it's also clear that these criteria disproportionately impacted, it's clear, the conservative groups. So the IRS can absolutely never be used as a tool against political opponents. I gotta tell you, wrong. <laughs> These wrongful policies made settlements necessary. The department has also provided legal counsel to agencies in legal counsel to agencies in this administration in favor of ending subsidies to insurance companies that Congress had not appropriated pursuant to the Affordable Care Act. I'm proud to say President Trump put an end to this unlawful practice. The executive branch, the executive branch had absolutely no power to spend money not appropriated by Congress. And similarly, no cabinet secretary has the power, through guidance, letters, or otherwise, to wipe out entire sections of the immigration law. But that's what the previous administration did with this Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA policy. Under DACA, without the consent of Congress, individuals here illegally who met certain criteria were granted not only lawful presence, but the uh, work authorization and uh, the right to participate in Social Security, which unlawful immigrants are not entitled to have. So no matter what one thinks about the immigration issues and, and, and policy, it cannot be defended, in my opinion, lawfully. So once again, the department advised and the administration put an end to it. And it's been ended, it's being ended now. The department is also restoring the rule of law through litigation our Solicitor General, uh, Noel Francisco. Um, I don't know. Uh, yes, he's right. He's a member of this group. For a very, very long time. The Department is also restoring the rule of law through litigation. The Solicitor General has filed an amicus brief in support of the Colorado Baker, who was sued for refusing to bake a cake for a same-sex wedding. Although public accommodation laws serve important purposes, they, like other laws, cannot be interpreted to undermine individual freedoms guaranteed by the First Amendment. That includes the freedom not to provide creative expression for ceremonies that violate one's religious beliefs. So meanwhile, I've changed policies at the department that support our mission of doing justice by executing the law. For example, we're no longer allowing so-called sanctuary city jurisdictions to nullify federal immigration law if they want to receive discretionary grants. And we have placed conditions on these grants to encourage our elected leaders uh, of these states and cities to comply with minimal cooperative requirements uh, to assist in removing criminal aliens from the country. In June, I ended the practice of third-party settlements under the last administration, the Justice Department often required settling parties to pay settlement funds to third-party organizations that were not directly involved in the litigation or harmed by the defendant's conduct. We believe that when the federal government settles a case against a corporate wrongdoer, any settlement funds should go first to the victims and then to the United States Treasury. 
not the bank owner. It's not the bankroll, third party, special interest groups, or the political friends of whoever is in power. Nor, nowhere does the Constitution grant unelected attorneys, even DOJ, one of the same attorneys, um, or political appointees, the power to effectively appropriate and distribute United States Treasury funds based on political alliances and friendships. Uh, neither does it give them the power to issue regulations outside the process of Congress is regulatory authorities uh, given by Congress. Too often, rather than going through the long, slow regulatory process provided in statute, agencies make new rules through guidance documents by simply sending out a letter. Uh, the cuts, this cuts off the public from the regulatory process by skipping the required public hearings and comment periods, and it is simply not what these documents are for. Guidance documents should be used reasonably to explain existing law, not to change it or rewrite the law. From now on, at the Department of Justice, that's what we're going to do. I'm announcing today this process is over. Uh, we prohibited all Department of Justice components from issuing any guidance that purports to impose new obligations on any party outside the executive branch. We will review and repeal existing guidance documents that violate this common sense principle. We will also now honor a directive that has been on the books at the Department of Justice since it was ordained by the man sitting in my right, Ed Meese, when he was Attorney General. I am ending regulation by litigation. The days of sue and settle, when special interests could sue an agency, then get the agency to agree to a settlement to impose, in effect, a new regulation uh, to advance an agenda is over. Justice is duty bound to defend laws as they are written, regardless of whether or not the government likes the results. Our agencies must follow law. We're not entitled to make it. Judges in our courts must apply. But we, but as we know too well, some judges fail to respect Congress and the executive branch. One particularly striking example, a bit in my crawl, I'll admit was a federal judge in Brooklyn who heard arguments on a challenge to the federal government's wind down of the DACA. Outside the legal question, the court said to the government, to our government counsel, uh, you can't come into court to espouse a position that is so heartless, close quote. Not unlawful, heartless. With respect, it is the province and duty of the court to say what the Law is. <laughs> I knew you'd get that. Uh, they, um, they are to apply and follow the law, not advance an ideology or express uh, political beliefs. <laughs> we cannot allow unelected judges to set policy through an abuse of the adjudicated process. Comments on policy like these from a judge are offensive. They unfairly criticize an attorney who is effectively doing his job. Judges have a solemn responsibility to examine the law impartially. We're going to resist this tendency resolutely. The judicial branch is a co-equal branch. It is not a superior or a policy setting branch. It needs to know its role. Those who ignore this duty and seek to advance their own policy views, erode the entire rule of law. They set bad precedents and importantly undermine public respect that's necessary for the courts to function properly. An increasingly number 
an increasing number of district courts are taking the dramatic step of issuing nationwide injunctions, orders that block the entire United States government from enforcing a statute or an executive branch policy or order nationwide. Scholars have not found a single example of any judge issuing this type of extreme remedy before the 1960s. Never contemplated, apparently, by our founders. But today, in effect, single judges are making themselves super legislatures for the entire United States. We've, we have nearly 600 federal judges, district judges in America, each one with the ability to issue an overreaching world or nationwide executive order eroding the, uh, duly, uh, the power of the President of the United States, for example. So the Supreme Court is consistently and repeatedly made clear that courts should limit relief to the parties before them. So if lower courts continue to ignore that precedent, then the Supreme Court should send them that message again. Enjoying the entire federal government is an extreme, dramatic step. To take that step because of a political agreement would absolutely be unacceptable. The Constitution gives judges no right to veto a president's actions because they disagree with him on, on policy grounds. So the medium, by the way, let me know, uh, only focuses, it seems, on decisions that go against the Department of Justice. But we are making, we also have some important wins. The Supreme Court has uh, vacated both of the appellate court rulings against the President's travel pause. They're taking it on the merits, but they've vacated uh, the uh, uh, injunction. We've also successfully obtained before the Second Circuit a rare mandamus order staying a premature and abusive discovery order in a case to stop the wind down of the DACA program. It's a, a, an overreach. And I, I don't know how many times you've seen a mandamus on discovery be granted, but uh, this one was, and we appreciate it. <laughs> uh, and so, Although some district courts have initially ruled against us, I'm confident our positions will be vindicated in the Court of Appeals and, if necessary, in the Supreme Court. The President Trump has the statutory authority to suspend immigration in the law of any individual or group of individuals he thinks, uh, he deems, uh, are contrary to the national interest. His rational, narrow proclamation of a pause from certain countries that are dysfunctional and, and provide risk uh, are, is justified within his powers as the chief executive who has a, the responsibility to uh, protect the public interest, and we're proud to vigorously defend it. So before I conclude, let me say this. There are those in this room, and maybe more than a few in this room, who get frustrated about when they turn on the TV at night, you know, and you have to take roll aids and uh, <laughs> got an opinion about what the Attorney General should do or what someone else should do. Well, I, I get frustrated too. A lot of things I'd like to be able to say and, and explain, but the rule of law isn't always about getting the outcome, you see. Uh, it's using the same fair process, pursuing the truth, wherever it leads. We can never allow any part of our legal system, and least of all, the Department of Justice, uh, to uh, be reduced to a tool for a political agenda. This department will not make decisions based on politics, ideology, bias, as long as I'm Attorney General. I believe that this is what the American people expect. <laughs>